Ladies and gentlemen, those who are in Geneva at the WIPO Center, welcome to Plenary 3. And welcome also to all of you who are connected through um, online, through Zoom. We understand it's the time where some of you are waking up. Welcome to the session on Plenary 3. Are we on the right track in terms of equality, diversity, and inclusion? So today, I switch roles, and I'm becoming the chair of this uh, session. And the link, are we on the right track from when? From last year. Last year, we had a similar session. And we started talking a bit timidly, shyly, and focus on racial equity. This year, now, because of some issues which happen, this panel is not too diverse. There are three men here talking to you about diversity and inclusion, but because there was um, some issues, we do have panelists connecting online, and we, I will introduce them very, very uh, shortly. The link is, we thought, several things happen from last year, and we need to have the courage to look into equality, diversity, and inclusion. And I think the mine action sector has started to be a leader. So perhaps let's remind ourselves of a few things, if we can put a first slide to show this slide, I would like you to know, you see this in his latest report on mine action. I don't have to perhaps read everything. The Secretary General welcomes progress made by the mine action community to discuss, to deepen discussions in this area, which is uh, EDI, including through our session here. So I would like you to know that this has been noticed at the highest level of uh, the United Nations. It's a link to last year's. Thank you very much. So through the intersectionality lens, today we want to look around what we have done and not only talking about racial equity, but looking into other forms of equality and inclusion. Some will talk about perhaps um, gender issues, where Man Action is also doing a lot of uh, good work. Some will look into access to uh, colleagues and the workforce and beneficiaries who are disabled. So we've tried to have a panel, not that we will resolve everything in that session, it's, but it's to remind us what's out there. But let me almost report to you, and if we can put the slides, what happened at the last session, we had a survey. In the survey was taken by 150 uh, colleagues sitting here and online. It's good to know that 34% of the respondents of our survey reported having directly experienced racial discrimination at their current workplace. Next slide. 43% of the respondents reported having witnessed racial discrimination of another person at their current workplace. Next slide, please. And if you see what type of the perception, if you go from the bottom, most about 60% uh, thought it's linked to disrespect. About 50%, 45% link it to recruitment issues. For their, from their perspective, they think it is uh, some form of discrimination racial. And then it goes to career development and microaggressions to exclusions and harassment and more. I think we are finished with that slide to tell you. 
Many things happen from last time to here. I know amongst yourselves there have been many regional consultations on equality, diversity, and inclusion. I know even at UNMAS there, is, there has been a working group, an informal working group working on racism. Uh, you would have those who are here this morning um, uh, at the opening, Under Secretary General Valo Vayam mentioned that she has a working group against racism and many, many others. So to make the link, let me give you one example and then I will introduce this uh, amazing panel joining us. Uh, if we can show that in the mine action community on the next slide, some of you would know very well this um, strategy of the global mine action of responsibility which um, uh, these days are um, uh, co-chaired by UNMAS and the Danish Refugee Council in Geneva. We are the global structure. But look at our goal. If we can move to the next slide. Goal number four is to promote equality, diversity, and inclusion in operations and workforce. We are trying to diversify, and we are here to listen and also uh, learn from you today, larger than the conversation on racial equity. I'm very pleased to have among us a very, um, I would say, I'm so sorry, my computer blocked, an excellent panel. Uh, Maître, uh, si, je, si je vous parle en... So now if I address you in English for your introduction, is it fine with you in English? Yes? Please let me see. We have on my left, if you are following from Zoom or in, in the room, uh, Maître Soudi Kimputu, who is the current Mine Action Director in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, lawyer by profession. He's an expert in disarmament and international security, and also a former deputy national coordinator on the National Committee on Disarmament and International Security of the DRC. Maître, welcome to this panel. Um, we should have um, connected, thank you, is it behind me? Thank you. Uh, we have uh, connected um, Assistant Secretary General Martha Elena Lopez, who is the ASG uh, for Human Resources at the United Nations. She has a wealth of senior level um, international experience in human resources m uh, management, and she has also participated in some initiatives of the United Nations um, on uh, anti-racism. We also are joined, and thank you so much, by Susan John, who is the Chief of Office of the UN Ombudsman and Mediation Services. Uh, she used before to serve uh, in Bangkok on the branch of UNOPS, and she brings really a wealth of uh, knowledge and experience of the UN system. A special thank you to Susan is because she was asked to be on the panel uh, as we had a last minute um, cancellation on the panel and we are so happy to have you. Um, is it possible to see whether we are uh, connected to uh, South Sudan? Uh, we should have a connection with Mr. Clement Suwali. I don't know whether, oh yes, it is working. Fantastic. Clement Suwali, who is um, the Humanitarian Mine Action Operations Manager with the Danish Refugees Council, South Sudan Country Program with 20 years experience and his work in many countries. I, I recall Mozambique, Cyprus, Afghanistan, uh, Somalia and Iraq and more. And then to my right in the room, we have Mr. Akihito Hayashi from the uh, JICA, 
Now, he is from uh, the Japan um, agency, but he works in Cambodia, supporting the Cambodian Mine Action Center, and he works on sustainability issues, and he has worked in several countries of the region, and before uh, Cambodia, if I recall correctly, it was Laos, and he also works on planning, monitoring, and, and information management, and interesting for us, works on South-South um, cooperation issues. Uh, pour les traducteurs, je vais passer... For the interpreters, I will switch now to French. So we will try to do this session uh, interactively. So I will start with Mr. Sudikim Putu. Perhaps if you could talk about the different roles, I would say, yes, what are the roles of the survivors? Some people call them victims. Can they play an important role when it comes to humanitarian response in the DCR, where you are, in terms of assisting do we say survivors or victims? What do we say? Could we have your views on that, please? Thank you very much. I would like to salute I would like to, to thank you for your questions. So the question of the roles of the victims, it is uh, uh, what uh, we, we, we mentioned with the inclusion of the handicap when we fight against mines. It's a need for all of our programs. It is a requirement. So on this question, for this question, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, considers these questions in all of its aspects. And uh, if we look at all the international treaties and the relevant uh, resolutions of the UN, getting the victims to participate in the uh, fight against mines in the um, in the um, in a, yes, it is a way to reduce risks and responsibilities. So it is a way to have a global approach when we consider all the elements of uh, the society in a non-discriminatory way. It enables us to consider that uh, explosive uh, devices, explosive ordnance, uh, strike, uh, affect everyone without any discrimination, and the victims who uh, the victims of these uh, explosive devices need to be informed and need to be aware so that they see by themselves what are the solutions that can be brought, uh, first of all, uh, with regards to themselves and in order for other people to become victims as well. So this enables us to take into account the threats and the impacts uh, related to explosive devices, explosive weapons. Of course, we will come back to it. Uh, there is also this question of uh, a gender as well amongst the victims. So this will enable us to integrate the, uh, the fact that uh, often people are victims of roles, the roles and responsibilities they have in their societies. So, um, faced with this question for the, 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 the Democratic Republic of, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, we told ourselves that we needed to start with the design of policies, the creation of policies. And this is why in the implementation law, of the Convention on um, Anti-Personnel Mines, there were some incentives for the inclusion of people with disabilities, in, and particularly the victims of uh, mines and of uh, uh, remnants of war. And the public administration, it led to the exemption of uh, double the uh, income, the income revenue 
for all companies and all services that give the jobs to the victims that give employment to the victims so there is some there are some tax exemptions for these companies so how can we enable victims to participate in the activities um, involving victim assistance so this is a complex question in a DR in the DRC we have two categories of victims there are victims who like who supports uh, uh, mine action other victims uh, actually mix up uh, mine action uh, partners with the people who have placed the mines so it is uh, very difficult to, to treat them in, to treat this in a separate way to treat them in a separate way so we thought we would need to organize these victims this is how we decided to create victims associations and we place them within synergies and from there they have the possibility the ability to participate in humanitarian action through coordination meetings through mine action meetings and to actively participate in these meetings and we enable them also to participate in the different clusters of mine action at the provincial level where these um, these problems occur and uh, it is submitted to the highest level of humanitarian action we have tried other experiments that have been successful and now I would like to take the case of some projects that we have led with the victims in the province of South Kivu in the east of the country where we uh, gave two cows to a family of victims and these victims had to raise uh, to breed these cows and once these cows um, reproduce themselves we give the little calves to other victims. We try this with goats, and some people are living off this uh, right to this date. For others, uh, war, uh, they have suffered from war and they have lost their cattle. So these are possibilities that can be feasible, that are doable, that we have tried in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and we have been successful. What we want to do, what has not been done yet, dear Bruno, is to enable these victims to participate, to also participate in the policy aiming at reintegration, the reintegration of their peers, to learn again how to manufacture a prosthesis in a workshop where there are only victims. This is our main desire, our, our deepest desire. Thank you very much. Uh, lawyer, and we do not have much time, but there is another aspect I was in the DRC uh, not long ago. I did a few visits and often we see it uh, in the um, in the mine action when we look at demining I see that it is uh, perceived as a, a role as a um, very masculine uh, manly occupations manly positions so can you briefly touch upon the question about how to improve the participation of women in mine action and if possible quite quickly and then we will look at the overall picture thank you very much right first of all we will look at the obstacles because these are it is these obstacles that prevent the Congolese women from participating in mean action mine action the first obstacles are cultural barriers cultural obstacles because there are some communities in my country 
that think that there is a category of work that women cannot do, cannot perform. And even in the army, there are less women. Because this is, uh, this is what the community thinks, that women cannot do this type of work. And this has consequences for my inaction. This is, there is also what I call something more complex, like some pe women would like to participate, but they have a feeling of inferiority, uh, be it at a management level or at a uh, personnel level, at a staff level. And also in the mine action, you have the first error is is the last error. So you need to, to know this at the operations level. You need to be qualified. If you look at the statistics, the trained women are the statistics of trained women. It shows that um, we are below uh, what is needed, what is necessary. And a lot of women don't have an interest in that. There is a lack of interest. So these are the main obstacles. So what do we need to do? We have gone a long way. We have integrated in the national strategy the mechanisms, awareness raising mechanisms and incentive mechanisms for women so that they participate they can they will be more able and willing to participate in mine action we have a gender service integrated in mine action service so of course if we look at gender there are both men and women and we need to f to to l make sure there is a balance in terms of the participation of women in mine action we have today the head of the Department of Information Management. This is a woman. But we have also been successful in this policy because most of the organizations that have worked with us in the DRC, this uh, corresponded to some organizations and was also this policy. We have worked with uh, Mark, that there were entire teams of women and even DCA that is there. Some people, some women don't want to take leave, don't want to go on holiday. So <laughs> there is the interest uh, as well as all the obstacles I have mentioned. So awareness raising is key and we're slowly uh, succeeding in order to achieve our objectives. Thank you very much. We the Congolese perspective on within the realm of mine action. So on the panel now, let's uh, go towards the United Nations, not in mine action. Let's think through, and I would like to see whether we can connect with um, um, Assistant Secretary General um, Martha Lopez, um, I hope you hear me, madam. Um, last year, yes, the session was focused on racial equity. Can you uh, please uh, tell our audience the progress made by the UN in this realm, in, in broad strokes? Uh, this audience is a larger audience, not necessarily United Nations. Uh, w w I think we are particularly interested to know uh, what the UN has done to focus on to address racism and racial discrimination. You have the floor, please, madam. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon to everyone. Just checking that you can hear me loud and clear. Loud and clear. Thank you so much. Good. So let me give you um, a, a summary of uh, the, what we have done uh, to progress uh, the initiatives uh, in this area. So in January 2022, early this year, uh, the Secretary General, uh, Antonio Gutierrez, launched a strategic action plan. 
uh, to specifically address uh, racism and promoting dignity for all in the United Nations Secretariat. The plan has a number of recommendations and a number of actions to bring about cultural change to transform the United Nations to a workplace where racism is actively addressed, where racist conduct is held accountable, and that the organization provides a dignified and inclusive workplace for all. The Strategic uh, Action Plan uh, recognizes that addressing racism will take time, requiring a deliberate, systematic, progressive, coordinated, and intersectional approach to its implementation. The plan also addresses personal, interpersonal, structural, and institutional racism in four change areas. First, organizational culture. Second, operation and management practices. Third, systems, including structures and policies. And fourth, internal justice processes. So just let me give you very briefly uh, what are the key uh, recommendations as set out uh, in the strategic action plan. Um, first, uh, uh, racism uh, is outlining that racism and racial discrimination should be addressed more directly and more effectively by encouraging reporting and enhancing accountability, monitoring, and transparency. Second, that reporting mechanism support processes and resources available to personnel experiencing racism and racial, racial discrimination need to be further clarified. That our HR policies and practices need to be reviewed to determine whether they are provisions or practices that need to be more inclusive and that may impact staff. And finally, given the low trust of staff, that dialogues should continue, learning and perception management exercises should can be continued in order to gain the trust of all staff at large. And perhaps just to conclude, uh, one of the areas that we have been working a lot is to find out about staff perceptions and staff engagement. So at the end of 2021, uh, we conducted a staff engagement survey for all staff members in the UN Secretariat. Um, from the respondents to that engagement, and it was uh, the response rate was 50% uh, of the total number of staff members that we had. And of all the respondents, 24% indicated that at one point in time in their career with the UN system, they had experienced some sort of discrimination. And for those responded, we asked more questions in terms of having a better granularity on what were the areas of discrimination had they been resolved and not resolved. And I, know, I won't give you the details here, but it was uh, uh, striking to see still that there were 24% and therefore, we will be diving deeply with each entity within the UN Secretariat to see how we can address those issues going forward. There were some positives uh, in the staff engagement survey because the portion of the questions on racism, uh, we had posed them to our staff the previous year in 2020. And there was clearly an improvement uh, reflected in terms of the understanding of the staff members uh, on the issue and particularly on the work that had been done in order to uh, um, uh, um, um, in order to have more learning programs for staff members in order to further understand the impact and the issues that come around racial discrimination. 
So I end up here for the for for the first question, and I'll be happy to answer any questions or any comments that may come uh, as a result of this one. Over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Assistant Secretary General. Um, so, given the statistics you gave, about 24%, which was already alarming, so the much smaller survey we did uh, amongst the mine action community last year, uh, the number of those who experienced some racial discrimination was even higher, so alarming, without details, of course. Uh, we are pressed for time. I do appreciate the progress that uh, the UN has made, some of the excellent points you raised. And uh, is there, uh, can you summarize uh, rather briefly, uh, give us some insights about the next steps in, in terms of you know, the way forward on this very, very crucial topic within the UN, please? Madam, you have the floor. Thank you. And, uh Based on the strategic action plan that I have uh, tried to summarize to you, as well as the results of the staff engagement survey, and the 24%, just to clarify, is the average of all staff members. Each entity could be higher or lower. So based on that, uh, we are, uh, as we speak, in the process of having discussions uh, with the fifth committee of the General Assembly to establish an office in the Department of Management, Strategy, Policy, and Compliance to do, a co a coordin to do the coordination and mainstreaming of the strategic action plan that I have described with throughout the organization. And finally, we will continue to evaluate periodically the impact of the multiple methods that we have done based on feedback, based on surveys, uh, in order to continue uh, at take, taking a pulse of how we are doing. And uh, also just to indicate uh, the joint inspection unit will be also concluding a report on this and based on the conclusions of the joint inspection unit, which is conducting a UN system wide review, we will be uh, taking action on those recommendations. And finally, just to really thank you for, for inviting us to, to present uh, the progress made in this area. So over to you and thank you to everyone. Uh, thank you, ASG, and if uh, time allows, if you can stay with us because we might uh, go um, to a question time with uh, several uh, hundreds who are in Geneva and as well online. So I think I'm changing orders. Let me stick to the UN to go uh, very well what you presented. Um, Susan John, Chief of Office at the UN Ombudsman and Mediation Services, um, in the realm that the ESG mentioned, uh, we know, you know there's an initiative that your office uh, has been provided to, to let staff have a space to come together and have conversations about sometimes very, very difficult uh, issue of racism, uh, at work. C can, can you uh, be kind enough to tell us a little bit about this, please? Susan, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all of you. Can you hear me? Actually, not very well, but I see the technicians are kind of turning the sound again. Can you try again, please, Susan? Yes, hello. Is that better? Much better for me right now. Please go ahead. Okay. So just let me know I can speak louder if needed. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you again. Um, to respond to your question, yes, the Secretary General had asked our office, um, because we are conveners of dialogues, to provide a space where staff could come together and share their perspectives about racism uh, within the UN, particularly within their workplaces. So obviously this was a big um, moment when our Secretary General uh, took the stance to acknowledge that racism does indeed exist within the UN system. And he called on all of us to reject and to address racism. He set up this task force on addressing racism and promoting dignity for all. And as part of that, our office was called to do these dialogues. Um, 
we knew that in order to achieve change, we needed to increase the awareness of staff and their understanding of racism and how it manifests itself. This is the reason why we started these conversations back in November 2020, soon after the uh, task force was set up, and we call them dialogues about racism in the UN workplace. So just to tell you, they are two hour um, interactive conversations. We call them dialogues, but really they're conversations amongst the participants where the participants in the session, they share with each other their perspectives. We crafted some questions. And so that allows them to sort of spark the conversation and listen to each other sharing sometimes very divergent points of view. The dialogues were also modeled in such a way that we were able to collect um, staff views about systemic racism anonymously without any attributions. And we channeled those to the task force, uh, which was working on this strategic action plan that ASG Martha Elena Lopez just referenced. Uh, this way, the dialogues were an avenue for the staff voices to be heard and then to become a source of supplemental data for the task force. So based on all of this and various other resources, the strategic action plan uh, indeed came into being. Uh, now we have been asked to continue the dialogue, so they will continue to serve as a forum for raising awareness, for sparking conversation amongst colleagues, and for prompting staff to identify what their personal needs would be and what actions they themselves can take in their respective spheres of influence. While we're still gathering the data anonymously to track any broad themes within the, uh, the dialogues that are coming up, that's part of our own mandate because we look at systemic trends within the organization anyway. Um, the focus really of these dialogues is to provide a space. We like to call them brave spaces um, for staff to talk and to listen to one another. Thank you so much, uh, Susan. Um, I'm obviously not going to ask you for confidential information, right? Your office is Ombudsman and Mediation. But can you share a bit what the gist of what you've learned from these conversations, if we have learned anything, and, and what would be the next steps now with your, what we call dialogues and conversations. Uh, briefly, because I'm being reminded that I am going over time, please. Okay, I'll try to talk fast. Uh, we did get lots of ideas. We harvested them through these dialogues. This is the, our model allowed it. And we saw that staff expressed a really wide range of perspectives about how they saw racism being manifested in their workplaces or how they experienced it. So there were staff who perceived racial biases in our uh, recruitment and promotion practices. Some perceived disparities in the ways that regions, languages, and cultures are represented within our workforce. Um, some staff noted that they experienced that less attention was being paid to their ideas or that mistakes were being attributed to their specific cultural backgrounds. Um, we also heard that staff there are staff who have not observed or experienced racism in the UN workplace and are unaware of its impact. So as you can hear, there are different manifestations of racism. We are learning more and more about how it can crop up, how it's manifested, and how it affects individuals, us as, as UN personnel, and ultimately how it affects our organization. Uh, as I said, there are staff who are unaware of how racism manifests in the workplace or leads to disrespect, exclusion, marginalization. Um, one thing we've, that has become clear is we still need to continue to bridge the knowledge gap between those staff who experience racism and those who may not even notice it, who have not experienced it, or who do not understand racism in the workplace. For the colleagues who are painfully aware of systemic racism within the UN, we do need to heed their calls for accountability. Staff are ready to see us take bold and decisive actions to hold people who do harm accountable. Accountability does not always mean formal reporting, although that is, of course, needed in some cases. Accountability might look like people speaking up, 
people being allies, acknowledging harmful language, acknowledging assumptions or actions that were harmful to others. We do have more work to do to build workplace cultures and systems that hold people accountable. One of the challenges we found in the dialogues is that colleagues sometimes want to shift the conversation. Uh, I know you talked about the fact that you're talking about a broader kind of discrimination. There are many, many different kinds. We understand that, that there are other forms of discrimination besides racial discrimination, and there's abuse of power. So we do try to take an intersectional approach that recognizes, of course, that race can intersect with gender, nationality, region, ability, position in the hierarchy of an organization, et cetera. However, we do try to encourage staff in the, in the dialogues that we convene to focus on racism and have the conversation around that particular form of discrimination, right? Talking about racism can be uncomfortable and people really do look for ways to sort of steer away from it. Um, one of the things that we try to really amplify is if we are going to address systemic racism, we need to stretch into our discomfort and maintain the focus on the reality of racism in our workplace. Those are important lessons, I think, for all of us. So obviously conversation itself will not dismantle systemic racism, but the dialogues we think still play an important role in the organization's overall campaign on anti-racism. The dialogues still offer for us an avenue um, to change the culture of silence, right? It gets us talking about this. And people have given us feedback that it is really powerful to be in these sessions to hear people talking about racism in the UN workplaces. So the dialogues are encouraging staff to practice having difficult conversations, break the isolation that some staff who experience racism may be feeling. We recognize it's long-term work, it needs to be nuanced. And of course, as an international organization, we have to respect and honor our different uh, histories, terminologies, and of course, our different views on racism. So what's next? Uh, we need to highlight big and small wins. This is really tough, right? Addressing the racism is a huge task. It's easy for staff to lose interest and to lose energy. One way is for us to communicate the small changes and also the large changes, ensuring that everyone knows that the campaign is about actions and not just about words. Uh, the other thing is racism and talking about racism is fatiguing and that's very real because it recalls trauma for people. It sometimes feels so intractable or staff have become cynical. The fact is some staff really are tired of talking about this topic, right? So there's all these realities. We still need to make our efforts sustainable. We have to support colleagues who are impacted by racism and we need to nurture our own sense of hope. I think this is really important that change is indeed possible. Part of how we can make this sustainable and empower diversity, equity, inclusion is to bring people with those subject matter expertise and focus energy on our anti-racism campaign. Right now, we're relying very heavily on volunteer efforts from our staff for whom this diversity, equity, and inclusion subject may not really be part of their core skill set. And there's, of course, the possibility of burnout perhaps missteps and maybe even missed opportunities. So it's important to get people who know the subject matter, right? We need more understanding about the equity part of the diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, you know, intuitively in the UN, we have an understanding for the need for diverse representation from different nations, regions, cultures, racial backgrounds, etc. The need to value and respect different voices and ideas. But racial equity is somehow more elusive. Uh, racial equity recognizes that some groups have been historically denied access and opportunities and that leveling the playing field will require giving those groups more resources, access and opportunities. This is complex and it's difficult, especially in our multinational, multicultural workforce. But the more we discuss them, perhaps the clearer the path forward might become. We need to feed people where they are. This is my last point. Racism impacts each of us in different ways. 
And we need to stay responsive to what our staff need to learn, what our staff may need to unlearn, and to do things differently, perhaps. Hopefully, we can inspire everyone to reflect more on racism, to help to listen to each other and think about the steps that each of us may be able to take to fight racism. Thank you again. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Susan. Yes, the, the words were inspiring, as were the words uh, from uh, ASG Martha Lopez on the UN side. Um, I have to tell you, open secret or not, even by organizing now, should we have stuck to racial equity or open up? So even while, while trying, so your words resonated with me, but at least uh, us on the UN side, UNMAS, part of ORLC and part of the department, we have started those uh, internal discussions, we have working groups, there is the anti-racism uh, ARAG, a group of uh, DPPA, DPO, so we are moving slowly under the larger, uh, I mean, from, from some of the recommendations of the strategic action plan. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I am late, I'm being blamed by my colleagues, my staffers, so please bear with us. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Akihito Yahashi, sorry I moved around, I, 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 I grouped the UN together, but we wanted to group you together on the same thematic. So if, if I go back to the original question, from your experience, we know you manage to train and facilitate, facilitate the participation of women, but specific to mine action, can you tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Hayashi. I'm from JICA, JICA advisor to CMAC. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about the, uh, this important topic at this timing. Um, some of you may not familiar with JICA. JICA is a part of uh, J the, is a government organization of Japanese government. It's a it's a well, we are implementing the ODA project in uh, um, uh, many uh, developing countries. Uh, probably uh, some of you are not so familiar because the JICA is the uh, um, bilateral organization, so basically we are working uh, on a bilateral basis. Um, but, well, since uh, JICA is part of the Japanese government, we, today what, what I'm going to talk about is the, uh, um, well, we, uh, the information is from the JICA also as well as the um, Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a whole. Um, well, Japan has been uh, one of the major donor, um, uh, donor countries in the mine action, and Japan is the, um, um, the non-Western donor country in mine, mine action. So this will probably give me a different perspective on this topic from other donors. Um, well, in general term, when Japan provide financial support or formulate programs. Well, equality, diversity, and inclusion are always keywords because Japan has been taking a lead to promote the concept of human security. And under the concept of human security, equality, diversity, inclusion are always taken on the top priority. But however, when it comes to mine action, there has been no specific project with particular focus on uh, for example, gender, race, uh, ethnicity, unfortunately, a priority is always put on the effectiveness and efficiency of mine action. Um, but meanwhile, um, in mine action, um, there are some past figures that Japan has been focusing on. It is about um, um, poverty reduction. Uh, this morning, we discussed the uh, triple nexus, and I think that Japanese approach in my action um, could contribute to this discussion, hopefully. Let me share two cases today. Um, the first is about the uh, assistance to Cambodia. Uh, Japan has been supporting the Cambodia in clearing landmines over the last 20 years. Uh, the total amount of support uh, reached 200 million US dollar. One of the features in this support is its approach. We call it integrated approach. Uh, which include not only clearance support, but also community development support. The community development support means here that project provide training, some training on agriculture or some others, and also construct some infrastructures like uh, community roads and bridges. 
Um, the reason why we came up with this um, idea is that there are socially and economically vulnerable people around the contaminated area, um, especially the, from gender perspective, um, that um, ma in many cases they, they are women or female, um, the residents there. Um, and they often lack capac capacities and resources to fully utilize the land, clear land. So community development components target at those uh, who are unable to utilize the land fully in post-Korea post con context. So with that assistance, the beneficiary, especially the female um, of clearance tasks could maximize the land usage. Um, so this is the outline of integrated approach. But the uh, outcome is very clear. According to the uh, result of impact survey, the annual household income increased by 80% in target villages. And percentage of household living under the um, food poverty line decreased 20, 20 points. So, um, in, so by taking this, um, the integrated approach, providing not only um, clearance activities, but also the community development support, then, um, well, we can, um, uh, uh, we, this shows the uh, um, kind of added value to the ordinary uh, clearance activities. So let, let me talk about the another case of Japanese assistant in uh, uh, Lapidia. Uh, Japan has supported the counterpart uh, government organization in improving the prioritization process of clearance tasks. So before we started the project, the, when the work plan on clearance activity was developed, the poverty issue of vulnerable people was not fully considered as a priority. Also, the criteria to select clearance sites were not so well organized and not so clear. So we work together with the Lao counterpart in developing clear criteria for prioritizing tasks, focusing on poor villages and poor households, also including the uh, female the, uh, status, uh, poverty status of females, so that the poor family could access the land on a priority basis. So these two cases reflect how Japan has approached my action from equal, equity and inclusion point of view. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you so much. Would you, in this round, because of time constraints, want to add anything or any anecdotes of your own personal experience or professional? But, but I'm very open. I know I'm improvising and my staff are probably not happy, but please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so le let me add some uh, my personal um, experience uh, while I was working in Southeast Asia. Um, well, the... Uh, is the in a sense, Japanese project um, also having promoting diversity. Uh, for example, when Japan um, introduced heavy machines in Laopedia to cut heavy vegetation, uh, one young female staff was selected as a team leader. It is not common in, in Laopedia for young women to play an important role to, to use such a big heavy machine. So this is one of the examples. Um, the other example could be um, uh, the disabled people. When I started the, um, the uh, project, and I was looking for a project staff uh, on information management, and one disabled person came to me and then he, uh, he said he wants to apply for the position. So, um, well, um, he couldn't find a job um, in the past because, partly because he was disabled, and in general, the disabled people were not so well represented in, uh, um, in the society, but I found him very capable and talented, so I hired, I hired, hired him, and then he, he delivered a re really excellent job. Well, lastly, uh, let me add uh, some thought about the uh, racism or uh, uh, race and equity, because it's uh, probably the main um, topic of this today. Well, I have been working in my action in Southeast Asia for many years, and there have been few, only few Asian international advisors. Most international advisors in the region are non-Asian. I found that between people in Southeast Asia and me, well, we, we share a lot of social um, and cultural things. Uh, that enables me to work with them smoothly and implement projects effectively. But some uh, non-Asian international advisors have faced some difficulties, especially in communication. Um, it was very unfortunate. 
Um, I'm not sure if this is related to race or racism, but uh, for sure there should be some ways to weigh out. So, I mean, there should be a solution to this issue. And if it's really, uh, it is related to racism, we, sh we should really uh, need to work on that. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you so much for those insights and uh, for sharing some of your personal views and experiences as well. Thank you so much. Now let me see if we can connect with uh, Clement, who, who is connecting from South Sudan. Uh, Clement, let's see if you he see and hear me. Yes, you're here. I see you. I had to close my laptop. Okay. Um, you've been in the, in the mine action industry for almost 20 years, and from your perspective, have you seen where you are, any change, and let's, let's make it large, gender, equality, diversity, and inclusion in the sector? Clement, you have the floor, please. Uh, first of all, I would like to check if you can hear me before I proceed. I can. The, can the room, can I get a thumbs up if we hear Clement? We hear him. Okay, yes. My, the boss of my boss told me yes, so yes, we hear you. Go ahead. Uh, over the last 10 years, there has been uh, a big shift within uh, the mine action sector, especially in regards to uh, the role of women in the sector. Previously, those who ended uh, demining tended to be from uh, those with a military background, where there were few women as well. Uh, those women who were in the sector, you will see a turnover, especially among those in technical positions. Uh, now, there are increased number of women in technical positions. Among us, uh, our DRC operation in South Sudan, for example, there are more female medics, uh, deminers, and those delivering EREs than they are males. However, there continues to be improvement uh, to see female deminers in senior management positions uh, or in leadership roles. Uh, say that to this, uh, there's also been a shift towards increased number of uh, capacity building opportunities and investments in national or uh, local recruitment and training within mine action. In the past, mine action actors were all uh, international uh, from specific countries uh, those who will come to live uh, little to no investment uh, in national capacity. Uh, why is this important? It is extremely important and uh, valuable to ensure balance uh, gender and uh, diversity among among us mine action operations. As it allows for better uh, representation, access, uh, cultural sensitivity, data collection, uh, and community engagement. In many of the locations we operate, it is uh, not appropriate for uh, women to interact with men uh, outside the family, or when men are away involved in the fighting, leaving women and children behind, who are themselves moving in and around uh, highly contaminated areas uh, by exodus. We need representative colleagues and team members to engage with the range of uh, people across uh, the gender, tribal, and on occasion, religious divides to better understanding and support them. This is particularly for our NPS. Finally, it is also important to remember that UXOs affect the entire population, irrelevant of their gender, age, religion, political affiliation, and all uh, their backgrounds. UXOs or uh, EOE may, may have been intended for the military operations, but often they uh, cause harm to people and their livelihoods. However, the vast majority continue to kill and maim civilians, destroy family ties and all our communities. My nation needs to be able to recognize and indiscriminate impact EOS on all persons. And therefore, also need to recognize the value of, uh, of diverse management, leadership, and the program to cater to those, uh, uh, to those affected. Improved uh, uh, diversity, technical areas of mine action such as EOD, NPS, and all, this education, and within among us uh, leadership of mine action programs, ETC, 
will ensure more responses, effectiveness, uh, holistic mining and programming. Uh, I don't know if I if I've answered you well. Thank you, Clement. You have indeed, and uh, and thank you so much for. Uh, I know you had to move around to get the better connection to speak to her, but we we are very much appreciative uh, of your answer. Now, in. We are listening to you worldwide, and we are in a room in Geneva. Because of some time constraints, I think I will move to, I know there has been interest, we I even, I'm not gonna call it a speaker's list, but some of you. So let's do a, a short version of comments and q and I know I already have uh, a few who have uh, wanted. This is the time, but if you can do the short version of your intervention, that would be much appreciated. My staff, you will help me because my eyesight is not that good. But let me try and see if you're in the room. I know there was interest from the Gender and Diversity Working Group. Or is somebody speaking? May I know? Over here. Thank, thank you, please. Is it a question or a comment? We are happy to hear from you. Muchas gracias. Vamos a realizar. Thank you. We'll make a comment. Um, talking um, in the name of the workforce on gender and equality um, that is composed by Danish refugee countries, the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demanding, the Hill Cross Humanitarian Inclusion, International Campaign for Nightmares, the Cluster Munition Coalition, Mines Action Canada, Mines Advisory Group, the Mine Action Review, Norwegian People Aid, and the Human Security Network of uh, Latin America and, and Caribbean CELAC. Thank you to the panelists for the presentation. This task force on gender and diversity is happy to uh, attend to this debate. We think that only through uh, an inclusive uh, mine action we will ensure the best efforts in order to reach our common goal, that is to stop the suffering uh, caused by mines. As activists, we know that inequality in engagement in this sector is not just a, a matter of lack of capacity of interest, but of lack of opportunities. When jobs opportunity, opportunities for training on mines um, works with communities or for uh, anything to include uh, concrete measures to include women, disabled people, um, people of different uh, ethnic and racial origins, and um, vulnerable people, we see an efficient uh, commitment and we will promote the respect of human rights. The diversity promotion in mine action requires to go further of age and genders. It should include uh, um, ori ethnic origins and other factors, so depending on the case. So last month, we could organize the workshop of good practices and um, lessons learned on uh, diversity and equality in mine action, uh, chaired by the Colombian um, uh, Mine Action Treaty, among others. This virtual event uh, gathered 100 participants, um, uh, among others, uh, diplomats, uh, local organizations, including survivors, and international speakers uh, in order to uh, share experience and learn from each other. We thank all the speakers of these workshops. From their presentations, we understand that when operations are adapted to uh, equality, gender, and diversity, we uh, improve our efficacy. We saw that we are working in, to include the diversity, um, but there's a long way to go in order to um, ensure that the communities affected are uh, protected. We hope to uh, keep the conversations going on. Every effort and the respect of the convention against uh, mines and 
uh, weapons only can be reached with a gender and diversity viewpoint. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. And uh, when you started uh, your statement, which is uh, extremely important, and, and, and we are, I was glad to hear so many organizations that are speaking on that voice and with these points. I understand we have either a comment or a question from the Palestine Mine Action Center. But I have to look where you are. Palestine, please. Thank you. I would like to introduce myself. I'm Brigadier um, Osama. I'm from the Palestine Office for uh, Mine Action. Um, in 2020, I'd like to talk about an experience that we had, which was a successful story in 2020 and 2021. Our Palestinian Center for Mine Action, along with the UN uh, Section for Actions, so with you and mass um, to increase the capacity of sending messages awareness messages um, to those um, for minds that are in remnants of war in Palestine so that reflect women men and boys and girls and anyone who have disabilities with funding from New Zealand we managed um, through you and mass to appoint a consultant um, at the Palestinian Center for Mine Action so that we would have a program that we developed to raise awareness of the risks of remnants of war, which was more comprehensive to more of the Palestinian society. The Palestinian Center for uh, Mine Action, after the training, worked with uh, the gender and uh, center in the ministry in Palestine. So it took 50 volunteers from the most vulnerable societies to increase their training. 70% of those volunteers were, from, were women. And those volunteers had to send messages and presentations regarding the risks at schools and other parts of the society, which were dis defined as vulnerable, especially either because um, they lived from the remnants of war and because they raised concerns because they were close enough to these explosives of IEDs and so on. Um, the Palestinian Center for Mine Action um, makes sure that there's guarantee of the quality of those re awareness sessions and that they will definitely have um, inclusion and gender issues taken into account. Our presence and the presence of females in our um, center means that we can reach a part of the society that we normally wouldn't be able to reach. Um, and therefore, we are now able to guarantee that we can, um, that all society um, members can reach these messages that would save their lives. Now, after the support that we received from New Zealand, in cooperation with you and Mass and the Palestinian Center, we can now reach to women and children through targeting the feminist um, centers and the family centers, which is something we can do in the past. We also found that the teams that, that are mixed of genders are more effective because those women um, who benefited from it found that they were more relaxed in offering their opinion when it comes to awareness of the risks. Now, in the past, if there's a woman in the team um, they were able to present their viewpoints more than if the team was only men. Now, the gender unit in the Ministry of the Interior managed to give its experience when it comes to including uh, the genders and have more equality between the two genders. And also they managed to uh, benefit from the experience of the UN entities in offering interventions when it comes to protecting the child and also general protection issues and also giving special experience when it comes to HR in increasing awareness when it comes to the risk of remnants of war. Now, as a uh, manager of the center in Palestine, I felt that the funding that we got from New Zealand in cooperation with UN Mass had given us a transitional move from the cent Palestinian center uh, over a year. We were trained and we worked in all the provinces in Palestine and the West Bank from the north to the south, where we covered through the center, the Palestinian center, we carried out a survey and the survey, we benefited from it because there was half a million Palestinians who are in need uh, of awareness raising because the Israeli army is training in our lands and he leaves bombs there, he leaves remnants of war. Now there were martyrs, there were people who were injured. In 2020-2021 there was a, a, an acceleration of um, the injuries, for example, hands and fingers being amputated, uh, which um, forced us that 
We must reach to all these groups and the presence of women helped us a lot. I personally felt that women have managed to get our message and reach more people than the men managed. And I really thank New Zealand for this support, which has continued to the state of Palestine when it comes to the mines. And we also like to thank you and Mass, and we'd like to thank you as well. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your remarks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with apologies to both the panelists who are here and online, uh, given the time and that we need to uh, uh, vacate and move to the other room, I, I will not have time to do final remarks uh, from all panelists with my apologies. Uh, but this was an inspiring session. Are we on the right track was the question. Equality, diversity, and inclusion. So it seems to me we are there. There will be some more painful realization. It may be difficult for some. The sector and the UN, I think, are moving towards the right direction. We heard whether it was from government agencies, NGOs, donors, that there is and there should be appetite for more equality, diversity, and inclusion. And I like to tell people usually, use your strengths to help us move forward. Nobody said it's going to be easy, but I just wanted to thank you and thank the organizers of this NDM UN to have allowed us to bring such a topic at the forefront in such a plenary. I would like if we could thank all the panelists. Thank you very much.